Hello, my name is Cole Worley, and this is an unboxing video for the John Company 2nd Edition MPC. Uh, this is the essentially the first fully manufactured copy of John Company. And what they do is while all the other pieces are climatizing, that basically just means drying, uh, they send me one copy to test the overall fit and pack and assembly of the game. As soon as we get that ironed, ironed up, usually the game is done drying out and then they'll start the assembly process. So this essentially gives me uh, one final check through the entire game. And I wanted to share this unboxing video so that you could see how the final game turned out. So uh, just for comparison and scale, I will set this next to Pamir. As you can see, uh, the box is the same aspect it has the same aspect ratio, but is quite a bit thicker. Uh, there you go. Uh, like Pamir, it's designed to be set any way you'd like, but we did go ahead and keep these spines all lined up. Now, the John Company box is about 50% thicker than the Pamir box. It's also about 50% heavier, especially if you put the metal coins in there. All right, let's take a look. So here's the box of the game. I'm really happy with how this overall print turned out. Really, It's kind of tricky. It's always tricky when you're printing things to work with very dark color colors and light colors. And so I really like that there's a very nice dynamic range here um, on the red. And then for the back of the cover, here it is. You know, the back covers for these games are always funny because they are designed primarily for people who don't know anything about the game. And if you're a Kickstarter backer, well, you probably read a Kickstarter page. There's the sides, and here's the side here, uh, and the top and bottom have the same side design. Um, but I like to put backs on our games anyway because we do see some copies go to kind of specialty shops um, and very small re retail outlets, and so we figure we might as well give them a good back. All right, let's take a look at the inside of the game. Uh, so here, like uh, Premier, we have an internal print. Uh, this is a uh, Chris Ware Malay piece of um, some emissaries meeting um, meeting some officers of the British East India Company. Or actually, the officers of the British East India Company being introduced to a court. Yeah, this is uh, in the court of Durbar, 1790. I really like this piece. Um, it was probably the most expensive single art piece, uh, historical art piece in the game. Uh, but I really wanted it for the internal box, and so it was worth it. Uh, then players are going to be, uh, for the, f the first time I should say, when you open your box, the box will be sitting about an inch and a half above the, um, above the box bottom. That's because the game's unpunched. And so once you have it punched and assembled, it will collapse down to its size. The box top shouldn't stick up at all. And the box is designed, I'll say this again, for both sleeves and non-sleeves. Um, both are going to work. Uh, if you go with sleeves, the fit is going to be a little tighter and you'll have to move things slightly differently from how I have them arranged in here. But I have a second uh, copy of the game that is fully sleeved and it packs up fine. Okay, uh, players are first going to have this little letter uh, or this little introduction sheet of paper. Uh, this is just single-sided print. Uh, it includes three things. An introductory letter that Drew and I wrote, uh, which basically um, introduces you to, to the game, reminds you that if you've never learned a game that is this big before, there are some kind of easy steps you can do to sort of get a handle on everything. I then have a suggested tray organization. This tray organization is actually even a little different from what I'm going to show you here. This is just sort of a starting place, and there are lots of different ways to organize the game. And then finally, we have a note on teaching the game. Uh, John Company is a really interesting game to teach uh, because there's a lot of uh, nest, it's like a, a big box of design with a lot of little boxes of design that contain even littler boxes of design. And so teaching it can sometimes feel like a little bit like a magic trick or, um, or like giving a, give it, giving a seminar or something. And uh, for that reason, I think I really like teaching. I think this game is a fun game for the teacher, but there are some easy mistakes that players can make and uh, that teachers can make. And there are some easy uh, things that you can do to make your teach really stick. We will also probably be commissioning a teaching video at some point, or I'll just see about making one, uh, getting one together myself. Um, so you can find that block right there, and that is the letter. Uh, we then go on to the rule book. Uh, this rule book is a little bit thicker than the rule book of Pamir, um, and it includes a little introduction section, and then it includes some components. Now, while this rule book is about twice as long as the Pamir rule book, 
Um, it's only about a third longer than the first edition John Company rulebook. And the main reason why it's longer is because we included just a lot more explanatory text, uh, frequently asked questions, points of errata, rules, rulings directly in the body of the text. So a good example of that is this negotiation spread where in the, the previous, in the first edition of John Company, I would say things like, oh, these are the things you can trade. And in this one, I say, all right, further details of transferring are right here. So if you are transferring these cards, here's these timing windows you need to worry about. And that does bulk up the rules a bit, but it makes them much more comprehensive. I also tried to keep the general tone of the rules a little more conversational. We include lots of actions here, little special cases in the gray boxes. Here's a nice hiring structure graph. Um, as we get into the company operation, you'll see examples for basically every office. Some pages also include these green boxes. The green boxes indicate uh, bonuses that are taken from the company with particular timing windows. Here's another one. Uh, and again, you can see just examples out the wazoo. Uh, here are the steps of the events in India. Now, most of the rules, if you don't include the kind of introductory and component section, we're really looking at about a 20, 22 page rule book for the bulk of the game. The events in India section is right here. Um, again, lots of examples, some historic art with commentary. And then here's the Parliament section. This is one part of the first edition that got really developed and built out. Another part is this deregulation section, which covers how private firms work. Uh, which is, I mean, the deregulation rules in the first rule book were basically a page and a half. These are, this is a six, seven page spread, but that's because the deregulated game in this is very built out. Uh, there's a lot of different things you can do. Um, I think, whereas the first edition, uh, hardly anybody played the advanced scenarios, my sense is in this version, players are going to prefer to play the campaign game or one of the shorter deregulated scenarios once they've played several games. Uh, then we have the solo rules, design history, dedication, credits, and then of course, a final essay. For this essay, um, it light, I basically adopted the same style I used in the premier rulebook. So this is a bibliographic essay. Uh, it's called Reading Empire's Origin Story, and it will basically just walk you through a lot of reading uh, if you're interested in learning more about the period. Instead of just providing people with a list of books, I like to give a little bit of framing to them. Um, so I, I kind of talk like, you should start with this book, consider this book if you're interested in this particular corner of the game. Um, there's a lot more writing that I could do about John Company, and I might do someday. Um, but uh, it was one of those things where I couldn't, I didn't feel as if I could fold all the arguments of the game in one single page essay. And so I'm gonna save that for a larger project elsewhere. Uh, here's the Crown Handbook. Um, this is used to play the solo game. Uh, it's a little overwhelming. Whoa, so much to, to see. But what this is, is basically the AI, the artificial intelligence of the bot that was designed by R Richard Wilkins, also known as R Ricky Royale and developed by Drew Worley. Um, it goes through all the offices in the game and sort of tells you, you know, if you are playing a game with the director of trade and the bot and you're the director of trade, here's how the bot's gonna react to you. If the bot, the crown is the director of trade, here's how the, the director of trade is gonna react to you. Um, so it's great, uh, really amazing design. I think people who love a good chewy solo game are gonna find so much to explore. I mean, this is a bot that will negotiate with you and hear all of its behaviors with all the game's laws. Uh, there we are. Okay, we then have um, two player aids. Uh, there, there are two copies of the same aid. Here they are. And on one side, we have a guide to the events in India. And this will answer almost every qu common question that you run into as you're resolving the events in India. And then we have the operation of the company. And this collapses about 15 pages of rules into a single page. Um, and so if I were writing the first edition, you can imagine the rule book wouldn't be very long, right? Because it'd be kind of terse. Um, if you have a question about how the offices operate, you can look at this player aid and find it. Now, I like to only include two player aids in most of the games I work on, as opposed to five or six. Uh, and the reason why is because I find that play aids can take up a lot of space. Like, I don't want a play to be a part of a player's personal play area. I'd much rather them be referenced than set aside because players do outgrow them as they become more familiar with the game. All right, now I would like to stack all of the um, player pieces on top when I'm packing away the game. So we have six player pieces, six colors. Every color features 18 family members, each with a unique design. Um, every family has the same set of designs, but there are 18 different ones. 
and you can get a sense of the, of the, the player colors here. Hopefully the reflection is not too bad. Actually, let me just take a few out. Here's uh, this color. Um, I really like the colors of this game. Uh, they are colorblind friendly uh, for, I think, basically every combination. Um, you know, it, it's one of those things where you can, it's very difficult to make a game that is colorblind friendly along every single possible access. But if you do some good work, you can do make it so it is capturing like 99% of all colorblind players. Uh, I'm a little colorblind myself, so I always try to give extra care to it. Uh, oops, those are sideways. Here are the family pieces. Um, really like them. We went with a, a, a little bit of a chunkier piece of wood here, and then the cameo prints are great. Uh, we ended up using heat transfer because heat transfer allowed us to have varying secondary colors. So for example, here are the green ones. And then I can compare that to these yellow ones, which use a kind of darker gold. And this secondary color actually allowed us to get around uh, pretty much all issues of colorblindness um, because we could key, even if you struggle with these two colors, for instance, which you might, um, when you flip them over, we shaded the, the green a little darker and this a little, a little uh, oranger. Um, okay, so those are the player pieces. Again, super happy with how those turned out. Uh, next up, just kind of stick these to the side. Don't mind me. Uh, okay, so player pieces. No, uh, I also included, before I forget, promise cards. I like to put these just in the family bags because you're always going to be using them. Uh, every family has a number of promise cards, like this. And these promise cards are tokens of exchange in the negotiations. Now, so this, for example, uh, let's see, let me find an easy one to explain. Uh, oh yeah, so here we go. Uh, take two pounds or less from me at a point. So if you want to bar, uh, borrow money from someone to show them that you're not going to renege on that contract, you could say, hey, I'm going to give you this promise card. It's guaranteed by the Larkins family. And again, testament to our playtesters, we decided there's always, whenever you have an object like this in a game, there's always going to be a lot of like finer points in the rule subtlety. So what we did is on the back of these cards, I put all of the timing and clarifications, exactly how they can be used, all that kind of stuff. It's right here. And so every one of these has a unique timing and clarifications. And so all those clarifications are on the backs of the cards, which again, you know, that's the kind of thing that you might never need, you might never use. And so my, my preference is keep the text that is used commonly as short and simple as possible but then put the clarifications in the easy reach of the players. Okay. Uh, these little, uh, these are opportunity uh, marble glass beads. Uh, they're similar to the glass beads that you see in uh, Root, uh, except they're white, uh, they're transparent. Those would normally go in the player bags. I just haven't put them in them yet. Uh, this bag is, which looks like a bunch of random pieces, is actually all the pieces you use in the setup. So these, these pieces are always used in the game no matter what scenario. And so I actually, I, I pack up my games so that they are set up quickly. And so I like putting all these pieces right at the top because I'll set that to the side. And then when we get the board out, those are the first pieces I put on the board. And here we have Pitt, Pitt the Younger, uh, in Prime Minister uh, dial shape. So this is the Prime Minister dial. It's used to mark who the Prime Minister is. It's one of my favorite design elements of the game. You can spin his alarm around, indicate different policies. Um, we uh, worked very hard to get this arm shape to be uh, correct. And uh, then there's a little rivet there in the middle, so you'll have to assemble this yourself. Uh, and then on the back, we had went ahead and included the full piece of art. This is an art by James Gilray. All right. One fun note about this, you'll note that his hand is holding the world on a string with this like funny little spindle thing. And then I had to have Yannick, uh, the game's artist, do a little bit of Photoshop magic to tilt his hand and to make it so it looks like he's pointing with it, which is how I need him in this, in this attitude. Okay, uh, we have the Superintendent of Trade in China. This is just a uh, two, all the punch in this game is two mil gray core. Um, it's really, I'm really happy with it. This is used when you open trade with China. Uh, we have the crown board. This crown board is used to track a few different things about how the AI player works. So this will not be used in every game. And then we went ahead and included a uh, Thomas Rawlinson piece uh, called Odd Characters that I really like um, that we just stuck there on the back. Because if we're printing on two sides of everything, we're gonna put art wherever we can. Okay, 
let's talk about player boards. The game includes six of these player boards. Um, one for every family, the Paxton family, the Walsh family, the Hastings family, Sykes family, uh, Larkins, and the Benyon family. So here they all are. I don't know how that's going to capture on video. Um, this is another place where the player board served as a um, place that we could use. I mean, really, the only gameplay element you're using is right here. You'll have that transparent marble, which will move around to, to show where your opportunities are in the family phase. But I also wanted to provide players with a little bit of explanatory text. Now, the, the first edition board put a lot of the explanatory text on the board itself. And in this product design, I pulled a lot of the text off of that central board and instead put it on places like the player boards. So for example, all of your questions about the family phase are gonna, probably gonna be answered here. The London season phase, probably gonna be answered here. And then we have a little list of helpful reminders, including reminder of what you can transfer, what are your sources of power? What are your sources of victory points? And then everyone's most favorite thing to reference, the chances for success success table sitting on the back. If you are playing the deregulated game, when you start a firm, that firm is gonna be on the back side of your player board and all the different elements about how the firm works sit there. I really love this piece of graphic design. Probably my favorite piece that I did for the whole game. Track the firm value up here. You've got different treasuries, your trade bids, all that stuff. All right. So those are the family pieces, so uh, the family boards. Now let's take a look at the bottom part of the game. Bottom part of the box. Okay. So here is the board. I'm gonna go ahead and move this box aside. We'll get back to it soon. Here's the board of the game. It's in a serpentine fold. Um, whoop, let me get it right laying very flat here. I hope that is picking up. I'm actually gonna check my cameras back to make sure that it looks good. Oh yeah, see, I'm glad I checked. Whoop, there you are. Um, so this is the, uh, one second, let me make an adjustment here. Ooh. There we go. All right, uh, here we have the board. Um, uh, I don't know, there's so much to say about the board, uh, but the main thing I'll get at is it's a six fold in landscape orientation. Um, the reason of every one of these panels is roughly the size of a US letter sheet. Um, I really like this board size. It gives players about a foot, depending on, if you're on a, playing on a standard table, you've got between eight inches and a foot of player space in front of you. Um, it's designed to be fairly compact um, and it contains a lot of detail, but isn't an overwhelming object and that is chiefly because we, again, moved all of the player aid information onto the uh, the other pieces and things. Um, okay, so now, um, you know, I'll, I'll say a couple things else about the board. You know, all of the, the prizes are now pre-printed on the board, the different estates that you can score. Here's the turn tracker. Here's the, uh, essentially the sequence of play. And then we have um, all of the orders in India, the events in India, the political status in India that used to be spread in a couple different areas in the game, it's now right here, this giant map of India. Uh, and then we have the, the different company armies sitting there. You know, one thing that would happen in the first edition is you have all these pieces like spilling off the board, uh, and now it is just integrated into the general shape. Okay, now remember that those pieces that I had earlier, um, you know, when you're setting up the game for the first time, I'll just put a few of these where they go. Uh, these red pawns are used to track company assets. I wanted a pawn shape because they reminded me of traditional Victorian board games. And so uh, you put you know a pawn in the company standing spot. Uh, this silver pawn is used to track the current phase. And then the black pawns are used to track um, the current turn. And then also the, there, there's a pawn that will track votes. Uh, these are power pieces. They track the status, the power status of different kinds of asset classes and they go on this little tree right here where they will jockey for position with one another. Um, and then these are the local alliances. Uh, they are color coded. So these kind of kind of reddish brown ones are gonna sit right here in a little stack. Uh, this one will sit there, that one goes there in that stack. And then these tokens right here are the region control and loot tokens. You just kind of put them floating in the, in the different regions. I like to put them right around here. Uh, and then hide our bed goes there. Um, yeah, they can just sit, sit wherever. Uh, and then when the regions are conquered, you add them to the presidency that is associated with it. 
Again, you know, that's only just some of the pieces, the rest of them are in here, but you're gonna use those pieces every game in that same way. So you might as well just stick them all in a bag together. Uh, you know, once players know what's up, you can have this entire game set up in like five minutes. Um, and then the, you know, it's, which I think is really uh, lovely. I wish more games had fast set up. All right, so that's the board. Um, also, the board, uh, a lot of the initial graphic design, so if, if you've looked at the original Kickstarter page, the board looks kind of like this. Um, but so much of the, the, the character and charm of this board was put in um, with, by, by Yannick, uh, the game's illustrator, who did just a fantastic, um, a fantastic job. All right, let's get to the rest of the box. So, um, here we have the box. Uh, you'll note that we have two storage trays. I have the metal coins directly in this box. Um, if you did not get them, worry not. You've got lovely, lovely uh, punch board coins that are, turned out really well. They take up basically the same amount of volume, so they're gonna fit in the same spot. If you want to put both your punch and your metal coins in the same box, you can do it, uh, but you'll have to be moving some, some things around a little bit. Okay, there's a little finger hole here. It, it's, it's held here, which is, um, you know, you can still get at it. Um, I just didn't want people, we always got complaints of people splitting their boxes by going on the edge, so we included this little finger hole. So you can pull off the lid. Okay, uh, let's talk coins first. So here are the metal coins. You can see we've got, uh, this is one of the most expensive and least lucrative things we've ever produced. And that is because uh, we've got four different finishes um, and you know I think three different thicknesses and these coins are physically quite large. Um, this is about the size, the smallest coin is about the size of a Premier coin. So here we have the ones, here's the twos. You'll see they do share a back, but they have a different uh, denomination on them. And then the fives, the faces. And then the denominations on the back. So really happy with how these coins turned out. I mean, these big, even if you look at, compare the ones that have the similar kind of gold or bronze or finishes, there's no mistaking these coins. Um, they have super different sizes, super different thicknesses. Um, it works out great. And you know, most commonly you're gonna be using ones, twos, and fives. The tens kind of come out in the late game, make you feel like king. Uh, one little note, uh, someone told me, or I, I read once somewhere about these um, rulers on coins, if they were like adjacent, they'd be like facing each other. And so I wanted to include two faces that were looking opposite directions. Um, th th there's some interesting rule about it that I'm garbling right now, but um, I, I, we, we, these are not actually period coins. We modeled them off of existing period coins, but with several adjustments for gameplay, uh, like putting a giant number on them. Obviously a period coin's not gonna have a giant number. Um, I also want to give a special kudos to the people on the Discord who helped us get every one of these letters absolutely correct on the 10 coin. <laughs> um, and there's a whole, whole saga there. So there you have the coins. You know, these trays um, are designed to be used during play, which is why I kept them shallow. So uh, the shallow trays are very easy to reach from, very easy to see what's in them. And players, when they're playing the game, will just set this to the side of play like that. Um, Cool, so there's tray one. Uh, tray two includes pieces that are commonly used uh, over the course of the game. You're gonna have general player ships. And I like putting these in this big chamber on the far right because you can easily find the name of the ship. So if someone says, I'm looking for, I don't know, the Thistleworth, you can say, all right, Thistleworth is here. So here's the Thistleworth. And then the back of these is the fatigue side. Uh, over here is the company ships. Um, East India Company built ships, many were built in India maintain them, those are called company ships. They also had extra ships, which were ships on short-term leases. And then in this box, we have regiments. Regiments go in the armies and then get exhausted when they're used. And then we have filled order tokens. Uh, these are used when you don't have riders to put on the board. Uh, and then sometimes orders get closed. And um, because we only needed as many of these tokens as there were orders in India, it made sense to put the closed token on the back just to show that the order was not up. Close for trade. Uh, we have these little trophy tokens, trophies and past laws. These are power tokens that players get for completing certain things. Uh, one of the big adjustments of this game from the first edition is there is a secondary economy 
uh, power. And power means just what it is. It, it, that is the power to hire, to fire, the, the power within um, the structure of British, British society. And um, whoever has the most power is gonna get an amount of victory points based on uh, the game's current turn. And so this is like, uh, you know, power is worth, essentially it's a race, it's like an area majority game where you're playing a race to see who can get the most power and then that player is gonna score a fixed amount of victory points. Um, you, you also get them for finding trophies in India or, or uh, from passing laws. And so these little tokens are used to track those things. Uh, and then lastly, up here in the top uh, left are uh, a variety of miscellaneous pieces. Uh, these are, for instance, gover uh, governor overlays. So for example, if Bombay falls under the control of the British East India Company, you put this overlay right here. These slots are usually um, held by towers, which we'll talk about in a second. And then the reason why uh, we wanted these overlays is because when players trade in India, oftentimes they send riders out <coughs> to sit on the orders. <coughs> uh, excuse me. Um, but if they're a governor, they're gonna sit on top of this overlay. And that, you, you probably can't see it very well on the camera, but that does give a little dimensionality to the board, which is nice. Makes them not blend in. All right, and then of course, um, the other thing that gets used sometimes in this uh, box are the little metal flags. We've got a whole bunch of them. I'll take out a couple, because we'll use them in examples in a second. Um, here they are, there are three different types of metal flags. Each one has one large flag and four small flags. Uh, and these also have different metal finishes on them. I guess I'll, I'll raise them to the camera. You can also see the large and the small. They are pretty small. Now, why I put all these things in one area <clears throat> is because you don't use this stuff very often. It's very situational. So maybe once per game, maybe twice per game. And so they don't need, um, they don't need to be in a you know in a place like this where you can easily reach it. They can you know you can fumble a little bit to get it because you're not using it that often. All right, those are the uh, trays. Set those aside. All right, let's talk about the bottom. Now the bottom tray is not really designed to be removed. You can remove it. I mean, it's not going to hurt anybody. Uh, but basically everything in the bottom tray will often come out um, to set up the game. Uh, and so you know when I'm setting up the game, I usually get everything ready to go get the board out, put those pieces out, and then I look at the bottom of the tray and I just scoop out stuff and kind of put it around the area of play. Uh, so we'll go through these. Now I have these flags out, so we might as well talk about how they work. Uh, there are 20 tower levels and you'll see that they snap together really well. You know, it was a little bit of a bummer. We had wanted to make these resin, uh, but we found we couldn't get the resin to stack very well. And so I thought, okay, we'll make them plastic and we'll put a wash on them. And we did the wash and the wash made them so gummy, like they'd stick and it was, it just wasn't very pleasant at all. And the wash also didn't make the sides look good. I mean, I like this design. This design was done by a person named Amarjeet, uh, who you can find his information. Um, I just can't remember his last name at the moment. Uh, it's in the rule book. Um, who did a wonderful job on the, the, the general sculpts here, uh, which are modeled a little bit after the Red Fort and some other inspirations. Uh, but we just couldn't get him to take a wash. So we decided to have him be, be nude, which was fine. Um, and they are designed to be stacked, and then you put a little tower cap on top. A tower's strength indicates, is indicated by the uh, height of the tower. So for example, this is a tower height zero, so Bombay is very weak right now, Hyde Air Vet's pretty strong, Punjab's very strong. Uh, and then on the top of the tower, you'll notice that the towers all have this little hole, and you can, oops, you can insert a flag in that hole. Now, what I'll say about this is that this is a very tight fit. And it's a tight fit because the factory basically said, you want to make these very tight at the start at production because they will very slightly loosen and kind of relax as, um, as players use them. Uh, you know, the hole is deep enough that you, you can play this game hundreds, hundreds of times and not worry about you know, the hole ever getting too wide. But it does mean that the first time you use one of your domes, uh, you're going to have to be very careful about putting um, putting the flag in. And so I usually just kind of press with my thumb and kind of get it in there. Oop, there we go. It's a little hard at the start, but you know, uh, but you, you get used to it. Um, and with every play, it gets a little bit easier. Uh, so here we have how those look. We'll just put a... So in this case, what this is indicating is Hyderabad is the capital. These on the sides. 
Hyderabad is the capital of a little empire in India that extends over here to, to Bombay, Gujarat, this whole region. Uh, there you go. And so again, uh, the metal flags I'm really happy with. They look flipping great. Uh, they're a little tricky to put in, but it's not a big deal. And um, yeah, I'm just, again, quite happy with, with, how, they, with how they turned out. Um, do, do, do. Okay, so let's go ahead and I'll put the flag over there. Okay, uh, we also have these cubes. Uh, these, are, uh, these cubes are used for two things in the game, uh, which is they're used to mark unrest in regions that are controlled by the company. So for example, let's say this, this region had been conquered and was under company control. If there was unrest, you'd be building it here. That's why this color matches that the color. Um, but the cubes are also used to uh, mark as fatigue on player offices. We'll talk about later. So you have a lot of cubes. Uh, we also have this lovely resin elephant. Um, this resin elephant is uh, a little smaller than the uh, minaret in Pamir. Uh, really fun piece to hold, it has good heft to it and it will often sit on the boundaries and it shows where there's trouble brewing. Like, is this empire in Hyderabad, is the Nizam getting ready to invade, you know, this region of India, perhaps? And so you indicate that with the elephant. Um, okay, uh, let's talk about dice. John Company includes 10 uh, standard dice. And these dice are kind of, they have a red and kind of dark red, maroonish, uh, even blackish kind of uh, marbling to them. Uh, I really wanted, so like, I love how the colors of this game work. And so we really wanted like a kind of red marbly die. Um, one of the problems working with marble dice is that if you want the marbling to be really contrast, uh, to have high, marbling often looks best with high contrast, but that can then mess up your pip shape. So we went with two kind of darker colors. So the pips kind of, you know, jump right out at you. Uh, there they are. These are 16 millimeter rounded dice, kind of standard. They look like Chessex dice if you have a pair of classic Chessex dice around. And then this is the Storm die, which is a little larger. I think it's a, I think it's 20. I think this is a 20 millimeter die. Uh, larger because we wanted the big faces. This is also like a big, important, scary die. Usually whoever uh, you want to bully uh, should be the one who wants to roll this dice because they're going to get the blame for all the bad things that happened to the poor ships in the Eastern Indian Sea. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's go to the next thing. Um, we have in the bottom tray, this bottom area right here is, uh, these are pr crown promise cubes. And then these are the firm cubes. Now these don't have a secondary color on them. But that's because they're very easy to track. You're only going to have one or two of these in play. It's going to be immediately obvious who's belong, who belongs to, to whose. Uh, and then over here, these are the cards. I mentioned that the firm game was uh, beefed up quite a lot. Um, these are the every player has a set of four uh, trade strategies that they use to secretly bid. Aha! I'm trading in the south. Um, and so everyone's got a set of these. Now I don't include these with the player bags because in almost every circumstance, players are gonna look at them and say, what are these? And you're gonna say, put those back in your bag. And so I say, well, let's just put it right in the tray. Um, now in turn, and so then, you know, the, the few times a game where you need to give players their firm pieces, you just go into the box and, and get that. Uh, now looking at the tray organization generally, you'll see that there are three chambers for car for big size cards, and there are essentially like four chambers for small size cards. That's because each of these chambers can hold sleeved cards or non-sleeved cards. And I'm moving around the card to show the extra space needed. And so we, when you are sleeving your cards, basically the components that are in here, some of them are going to need to be put in other trays and organized a little bit differently because the sleeved cards tend to be about 50% thicker if you're using a premium sleeve, which means these two stacks will probably become three stacks. These two stacks will probably become, you know, one and a half. Or these two stacks will become three and a half, maybe four stacks. Um, now, there aren't finger holes here. Uh, and what I suggest people do who sleeve their cards is use one of these small stacks in the bottom and then put the remainder of these cards on top. That will allow you when you pick up your cards to just like cantilever them out really easily. It's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. Y'all are smart. You can figure it out. Um, okay, we'll talk about cards in just a second. But first, I want to talk about these. These are the Ganjifa tiles. Uh, Amita Pai did the art here, uh, done in a kind of traditional 
um, style that would be used on the Ganjipa tile. These are modeled after uh, Indian playing cards. Uh, and so we went with a one millimeter punch. They're actually not cards at all. They should wear wonderfully. So they have a nice clean punch edge. Um, I'm really happy with how these turned out. They feel great. They are like a dream to shuffle and uh, do this side of shuffling. Whoops. Um, yeah, they, they just feel awesome. Um, and then, you know, one of the goals of the game was to make the event system uh, remain robust, but be very easy to resolve. And so you'll see here at the bottom, we resolve the crisis. It's got this value. Uh, and then the elephant is going to move to Bengal. And we have this little like, you know, bottom text. This actually has been changed. It hasn't been changed, but it, um, we worked a lot on this last little bottom to, to make it clear how the elephant marches. But you can see, oh, there's another crisis. Uh, and then here's a windfall that would happen in Madras. And then this art here is coded both lightly to color and then also there's faded illustrations from the Ganjifa so you can kind of get a sense. Here's the, the shuffle event, there's another crisis, turmoil. Tried to keep these very, very simple. I mean, this is probably the simplest one in the game. Turmoil, close the northernmost open order in Maratha. If all are closed, you do a cascade. I'm gonna go ahead and tell you what a cascade is right now. This kind of stuff where I'm just adding an extra line of rules, I'll actually bring that closer to the camera. This is a classic, um, not classic, this is a great representation of how John Company's rules writing strategy has changed from the first edition because I would have said in the first edition just perform a cascade. But here, I've designed the component so that there's extra room to tell you what a cascade means. Close orders in connected regions, easy. Um, all right. Okay, uh, there we go. Now let's talk about cards. We'll do this pretty fast because I know that this unboxing video is going a little long. So I will start with the small enterprises. Uh, you'll see they have these bright colors. Uh, these are uh, the enterprise cards. Now, if you played the first edition, you know that when you had a shipyard, you would just put a little cube on a track. Here, I wanted players to be able to easily trade their shipyards, so their cards. Every shipyard uh, represents a lease on a particular ship. So here's the uh, lease to the York, the Ganges, the Walpole, the Neptune, the Fortitude, the Union, etc. Um, and in fact, if you have that ship, so here's the Union, for instance, the, the, if the ship is fitted, it's going to be out in the sea. If it's unfitted, you put the ship right over. Um, we kept these very bright, simple colors so that players could easily look over the board and see the different um, see the different holdings of the players. So there we have those. Um, we ended up keeping the same art for the luxuries. This was because I couldn't find uh, historical illustrations that were in a similar enough style, and uh, it also was a little bit cleaner to just have them all be the same since they act they act the same. Um, okay. Then we have the office cards. This is one of my favorite adjustments of the new system. So, uh, and I could talk a lot about how these office cards uh, came to be. But basically, if you have a character who's the chairman, like that, you mark them there. And then in your player area, you will have this chairman card. And everything you need to know about how the chairman works is on this little, on the card. The, the card is essentially a small play. Aid. You also, as your characters get older and get fatigued, you put cubes on them to show they've been fatigued. Now, I like this being the same cube as these because they would never get mixed up. Uh, but you don't need two different colors of cube because that's just another component class that players need to track. And then if the chairman uh, re retires and wants to, to find to become a pensioner, you move them here to the pensioner's box and then you flip the chairman over and it will you goes to the vacant offices stack. And the way this works is you will, um, at the end of the turn, you'll will resolve, you sort this stack in order from one to whatever, and then you just resolve each office and they get hired. So here's the director of trade chosen by the chairman and the candidates are this, and then it gets hired and it goes to a different player. So again, that was a way of making it so players didn't have to worry about a big you know, blue line that was zigzagging through this board. I could put the information directly on the cards and if players wanted to visualize it, they can go to the illustration in the rule book and I'll actually show you that quickly. Just as an example, you know, if someone wanted to really study how the hiring works, well, like we have this lovely company structure illustration, which will tell you like how a writer could someday become director of trade. Okay. 
All right, let's keep moving then. So these are the office cards. Um, you use about half of them uh, in most games. And then, or not half, like maybe, no, I guess about half of them. Uh, and then, so here are the presidencies, military affairs, presidencies. The governor general is an optional office, comes in later. Or it's not optional, it's just it can be activated. Superintendent of Trade in China also can be activated later. And then you have the governors. And then that's it. Okay, these are the office cards. Just stick those over there. Uh, then we have the prestige cards. Now, the prizes here listed on the board are generic prizes. They're, they're just giant estates with, with tax liabilities and victory points. And to give them a little bit of color, uh, based on how much money you're spending, um, you'll also be participating in this London season. And so there'll be some prestige cards out here. I'm just gonna grab a few random ones. You got spouses, it looks like, in a social magazine. And so depending on what players are buying here, they're gonna take these into their player area. Because these are cards, some of them, like the social magazine, you can buy and sell other players. It might not be worth anything to you, but it could be worth something to someone else. And then um, the spouses cannot be traded, but they provide some interesting bonuses and things. And then some of these cards are face down, the black ones. This is a blackmail card. Uh, it has a special effect that you can get. And then all the blackmail cards kind of look the same. They have this lovely illustration of this scary devilly character. And then um, they have text about their effect, sometimes a power value, things like that. I will say this, uh, the, the graphic design for this game was so much fun because I had such a huge um, range of, of, of illustrations. I could use most of them being in the public domain. Um, okay. Let's move on. Okay. Uh, all right, so now other cards. Um, I have two little player aids. Uh, this one is for commanders, and this one is the Pocket Guide to India, which talks about the different events, and then on the back has what to do when you lose an event. Uh, these are small because unlike, like, uh, um, well, they're small because they don't need to have that much information, but also because they often get passed around. And these, um, weirdly, the more used a player aid is, the smaller it should be because it's going to be passed around. It's going to exist in the play area. And so I wanted the most commonly referenced things to be on these small player aids. Uh, and then we have six company failure cards. These are resolved if the company fails. So the, 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 when, when the company fails, we flip it over and say, oh, Parliament's exposed. Everybody who has a lot of past laws and things, they're going to get penalized. Industries greed condemned. Careless shipbuilders indicted. Basically, it's always someone's fault. And what this means is that if you are playing, it's a little bit like Twilight Struggle. You know, the player who ended the world has to lose the game. Uh, but you don't quite know what the, who the public is going to blame. But it does mean that if you are trying to tank the company on purpose, uh, you need to be aware that you might have certain vulnerabilities and you have to just adjust your strategy, build a little bit of distance. Um, this was a mechanism that came in kind of late in the development, but as soon as it snapped in, it made so much, so much clearer. So I'm really happy with how this turned out. Uh, then we have a deck of law cards. Uh, this is going to be held by whoever player, whichever player has the uh, prime minister dial, and they're going to be using these to decide the different... Um, the different laws that they want to pass. Uh, you have the Calico Axe, Envoy to China. You know, these cards, I will say, uh, they don't have illustrations on them. They're just uh, just game text. Um, I'm so happy with the design of these. Uh, basically, all of these laws, we went into the law uh, design basically with, with the idea that the laws should always be useful. They should always offer some adjustment to the state of play that could be capitalized on by some player. And so uh, unlike the, the, the first edition where the laws were a real grab bag, uh, every one of these laws I've seen used to some kind of interesting effect. I think they're really cool. Um, yeah, so here's the law deck. There are, I think, about, about 25 of those. Okay, now we have this deck right here. These are the, um, this is the, the solo AI. Works the same way as the Wakan AI where you flip a card and then this is going to give you kind of like the, the noise of the of the bot of the crown. Um, really, again, quite happy with how those turned out. Uh, and then, if you're playing with the deregulated game, there's a special law 
deregulation law, which basically the prime minister can call a special session of parliament and vote on this law, which has certain behaviors, all the rules of deregulation written right on that card. Again, this is the kind of stuff that another player would have to look up in the rule book. I just put it on the card. And then once deregulation passes, it opens up a debtor's prison um, for the firms that fail. Uh, okay, there we go. John Company, the game with debtor's prison. Uh, now, when I was looking through the rule book, you might have noticed that I never talked about scenarios. Well, that's because the scenarios aren't in the rule book. They're on these cards. There are three scenarios in the game, the 1710 early company, which can either be extended to the full campaign or can just be played as a shorter scenario. This is where you definitely want to start. We then have the 1758 scenario, the company under siege. This is one of the trickiest scenarios in the game. And then we have the 1813 post monopoly scenario, which is the scenario uh, for the players who just want to get right to the firms. It has all the information of each scenario set up right here. And then on the other side, it gives you the situation in India for the three different scenarios and tells you how to set up this board. Uh, and then the game's kind of complicated draft that was in the first edition has been replaced with this uh, modular setup system. And so there's a little deck of setup cards like this that you use to create starting positions. So basically you're, you shuffle these cards some of them are labeled extra cards, which are used in certain player counts. But you create your pool of cards, you shuffle them up, you deal out, you know, the player gets these three positions. And that means at the start of the game, they're going to have access to the military affairs office, the director of trade. They're going to start with six pounds, and they're going to have three shipyards with ships with these various placements. I love these setup cards. Uh, we spent a lot of time balancing them very precisely and they do a huge amount of work in making the game, uh, in, in creating really interesting and very asymmetric starting positions. Um, players who don't like chaos probably shouldn't be playing John Company to begin with, but uh, you can draft them. Uh, but actually, I find the random setups are more interesting because they force a player to look at a board position. It's almost like you have to inherit the problems of whoever was playing this game in the 17th century. And so I, I, I like that feeling of kind of walking into a room and saying, oh, I don't know what to do. Um, all right. I think that pretty well goes through all of the components. Thank you so much for your uh, time and attention. I hope this gives you a sense of everything that's going to be coming uh, your way in a few months. Um, again, I will just say this production um, was a real labor of love for everyone involved. Uh, this is probably the most expensive game I'm ever going to work on, period. Uh, there's just so much content here. And uh, you know, it represents, what you're looking at here represents basically um, five or six years of continuous work spread over a decade of you know intermittent work. So this is just a huge amount of game design and I'm so happy uh, with how everything's turned out. Um, I will be in the future producing some additional videos, probably with a better microphone than the one I have now. Um, and so I will talk about, I'll do a deeper comparison between the first and second edition. Maybe we'll do a small teaching video, things like that. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. All right, bye.